Let's take a look at Philippians. It is our book of study on Sunday. It is one of the great evangelism books uh, of missionary evangelism. A great book on, vision, on missionary evangelism. This little church at Philippi was uh, quite a church, as, we're, as we will come to learn uh, part of it today. I'm at verse 7. Remember that verses 3 through 7 is one Greek sentence. That's important. In verse 7, which is our subject text, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you. Paul has been talking about his heartfelt connection with the little church at Philippi because they were so responsive to the, to the teachings of grace. He said, it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. If you haven't done this, you should do this. You should read the 16th chapter of Acts this week for the background to what he means here. He, he uh, when he was at Troas in Asia Minor, he had a a call from God to go to Macedonia, which opened the Europe ministry. Now you really got to know that when he had the call in Asia Minor, he was at, he was struggling with whether he should take the gospel north or south or where where should he go because he. He was at the end of the ministry in Asia Minor, and he was seeking God's will for where he should go. And God called him, the Macedonian call is for Paul to go westward from Asia Minor. That opened up the European from Greece all the way to Spain, and, and of course, from there to the whole Europe idea. This call was very important to Paul. God said, I want you to go westward. I want you to go westward. Now, when he, when he crossed the Aegean Sea and went into uh, Macedonia, Greece had, was made up of two providences. One was uh, Macedonia and the other was Archaea. When he, went, when he got over there, he, he dealt with Macedonia. And Philippi came out of Macedonia, so, so did Thessalonica. He evangelized those two cities in Macedonia. He did a, a, a superb job with them, uh, was able to spend enough time with, him to, uh, with his team, his missionary team, to, ground, grind, to uh, ground them in the Word of God, and especially grace. He, he taught grace really heavy. You can see it as the people responded out of the Church of Philippi to the principle of grace support to missionary work. In fact, Paul said that this little church was the only church that ever supported his missionary work under the call of Macedonia. The call to go to Macedonia was a call to go westward. And Paul knew that. In fact, Paul knew that his that God wanted him to evangelize everything from, from Greece, Macedonia, to Spain. In Romans, the 15th chapter, he talks about that his call was to go westward all the way to Spain for sure. Uh, and that's why we call that the European theater of missionary evangelism for Paul. It's very important in Paul's life. When you study the rest of Paul's life from the Macedonian call, you're going to see something really important. When he stayed to the call to go westward, he had phenomenal ministry. When he broke from that and went east, he got himself in a peck of trouble. He got himself in a lot of trouble. Very similar to, to, to uh, uh, Jonah. 
when God told Jonah to go one direction, he decided he'd go another direction. That didn't work out too good. It won't. It didn't work out for Jonah. It didn't work out for Paul, and it won't work out for you or me. When God lays down his directive will to you and I, it's really important you obey it. It's really important. He wouldn't, he wouldn't give you a clarity of a directive will. That is what he reveals, and, and there's no doubt what he's asked of you. So when Paul gets to Macedonia, the, he evangelizes Philippi, and it was just phenomenal. And from Philippi, he went to Thessalonica, and that was a phenomenal ministry. Then he's going to leave there, and he's going to go to Archaea, and he's going to run into some, some more, he's going to run into uh, quite a bit of difficulty, but he's going to get C Corinth. That's where he got Corinth. He evangelized Corinth. There were other works that came out of, the, out of Corinth, but these were the three major uh, trophies of Paul to go westward. Do you got that? It's really important. If you study Paul's life, this is really important that you get that. Here's what's also interesting. Paul wrote back to the Philippian church in the book of, of Philippians. He wrote back two times to the church at Thessalonica. First, first Thessalonians and second Thessalonians. And he wrote twice back to the church at Corinth. First Corinthians and second Corinthians. He was really hopeful that he could establish them in the grace of God as he moved forward into Europe, into the European theater. So all that's really important. Now, what he's writing, he's writing the first book, he's writing to, to, the, the, to the little church at Philippi called the book of Philippians, and he's so proud of their, look at verse 5, of their participation in the gospel. In verse 5, in view of your participation in the gospel, he went in, he preached the gospel, and they got saved. That's their, that's their participation. In verse 7, we have a different idea about this. Where is, they're called partakers. It's, it's a, the same root word in the Greek. Par participation and partakers, you can kind of see that. But the, when we get to verse seven, in verse 5, Paul goes in, preaches the gospel. They respond positively. They get saved. Uh, Lydia, if you're familiar with Lydia out of, out of the book of Acts, she was the first convert of Europe. And the church of Philippi was the first church of Europe. The first Christian church in Europe was Philippi. And Lydia was the first convert and she opened her house, and her house became the first house church. And from that, a whole ministry moved westward in Paul's ministry out of that. It's just a wonderful story. But see, all that comes from Acts 16. you got to read Acts 16. Then you're going to get a good look at this. But sometimes we, we, get, we, we miss some of the hist history in all this phenomenal stuff. Now, let's have a word of prayer and then I'll get into the morning study. That's just to give you an introduction to where we're going. Let's pray. If you believe the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sin, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, when you believe that, you receive a common salvation that is the salvation that comes to every person who believes the gospel and is saved by grace through faith. That's a common salvation. Luke talks about it. Paul talks about it. It is in this word, partakers or participants. We're all part of a common salvation. We all get saved the same way. And that's a wonderful idea. To study the Bible and get the Holy Spirit working, teach and recall in your life, there could be no sin, and no personal sin in your life. That's carnal, and you can't study the Bible and get divine revelation in the flesh. 
Confession of that sin is important for Bible study. If we confess our sins, mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue and overt sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That takes us to the cross for sanctification. So we thank you, Father, for that preparation for our life as we prepare to study the word of God, to see the revelation to Paul that would be for us. I'm so proud, Father, that Paul responded to go westward to carry that gospel westward in the European theater because out of that came America. This is the foundational movement of the gospel westward. Unfortunately, it will take us many years to get it across the ocean to America. But we're thankful that it made it. We're thankful for those who were faithful in the missionary call, even though it took years to do it. Encourage our hearts today as we look at the book of Philippians and we look at the beginning of this whole European movement that wound up in America. And it began with the little church at Philippi. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to, want you to, I want to show you a connection between verse 5, participation, and verse 7, partakers. They're both dealing in the Greek. It's the same concept of words. Notice I put on your paper that the idea of partaker of grace has the preposition soon. See that on your paper? S-U-N. Do you see that? And then it has the word koinonos. All right? When you add a suffix to a word in the Greek, uh, a noun or a verb or whatever, it heightens the understanding of the concept. It heightens the, the idea. When you add soon, the preposition to a verb, it means together, often translated into English with you. I am joining you, I'm with you. And then we have the word koinonos, which means having something in common. And therefore, this word used in verse 7 means to hold the teachings of God grace jointly with Paul. They absolutely fell in love with the idea of grace. And you're going to see it in the writings, and, and you're going to see it as Paul mentions the church at Philippi to other churches that, uh, in the European theater at, at Philippi. Uh, uh, he's going to go to Thessalonica and you're, he's going to talk about this and then he's going to go to Corinth and he's going to talk about this. This little church really established a beachhead for grace uh, moving into European theater and you find it in Macedonia, part of Greece, as well as Archaea, part of Greece, in the conversion of these three churches. It's a powerful idea and is well established in the book of Acts and, and, and then the books he wrote back to these people. So that's a powerful idea. Write this down in your paper because I didn't. Write down Jude 3. Because in Jude 3, Jude says that we all share in a common salvation. The Christian church has one common salvation and that's grace. It doesn't mean that all Christian church believe that. But God established it to be that way. Everybody's saved by the same gospel, the same way. Everybody. In the plan of God, that's how it works. And Jude calls it the same thing that Paul called it, a common salvation. In other words, the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Christ dies for our sins. He's buried and raised from the dead. Romans 1, 16, you've got to believe the gospel. When you do, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is what saves you when you believe it. That's Romans 1, 16. Then, of course, the great landmark passage is Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace 
are you saved through faith? See, that's that believing side, right? Not of yourself, not, not of yourself. It is a gift, not of works. The boast goes to God. It don't go to man. See, so when you, when you link that up there, that, that's what's called a common salvation. The gospel of Christ is the same. He died, he was buried, he was raised for your salvation. He was raised to give you eternal life. He took your death to give you eternal life. He took your death to give you eternal life. And so that's very important. That's very important. And it's called a common salvation. Unfortunately, the church has moved off from center on that idea. It's, it's moved off from the center of it. You're, you're not saved in any other way. It's a common salvation, and it should be taught that way. Well, so we have that identity. In verse 5, we have a different word there. It's, it's the same a vocabulary word, but it doesn't have the preposition on the front of it. It is translated your participation. It's the main word, see? It's koinonia. It's the same word in the gospel. See, the ending of that IA can be an OS. It can be, the ending can be, it just determines how it's being used. It's the same word. But participation. And listen to how he identified their participation in the gospel. From the first day until now. In other words, the first day was when they got saved and they've held to the principle of participating in the grace program. A one common salvation is, is the gospel, grace by faith. That is a common salvation. That, that's it. There's no other one, biblically. All right. Remember that when we're in verse 5, we're talking about Paul's second missionary when he had to call out of Acts 16, early in Acts 16, he had to call to go to Macedonia, cross the Aegean Sea, and went there, preached, and from the first day till, till now, uh, that little church embraced the grace principle, the grace policy, the grace teaching. What does that say? Paul was heavy on teaching grace, wasn't he? You know why? Because he came out of a legalistic system. He came out of a law system. I've never known anybody that didn't come out of a law system that saw the grace system that just didn't embrace it crazy. I mean, they just go nuts over it. I did. I didn't come out of a heavy legalistic background of, ch of church. But those people that I know that have, they... I mean, grace just opened their world up. Uh, and it, it did for Paul, and he was a great teacher of it. In verse 7, it is only right for me to feel this way for you, about you because you are in my heart. Now watch this. Since both my imprisonment and defense and confirmation of the gospel. You know what he's referring to? See, they... You watch what he says. He says, you are all partakers of grace with me. Listen, he's talking about Acts 16. Write this down. Write this down. He's talking about Acts 16 when they became a participator with Paul who went to prison for, for, for evangelizing them, establishing the church, and teaching them grace. He, he went to prison. He went to court made his defense and his confirmation that he was right was the way God established a church and established an entire ministry in Macedonia. What he is referring to is Acts 16. Write this down. Huh? He, is, he is referring to Acts 16 from verses 11 through 40. Now, now this is a wonderful read, and when you go home today or sometime this week, you're going to read this, and you're going to get a chuckle out of this. This is a funny story, but a really important one. When Paul got to Macedonia and swept through there with the gospel of Christ, Lydia got saved, and a whole bunch of people got saved. They started a church in Lydia's house. Lydia. This was the first 
convert of Europe, and this was the first church of Europe, Philippi. First. Every day, they would meet at Lydia's home for Bible study and prayer and fellowship. The converts. Every, I know people, every day. I know, how does that? Every day, All right? This was a young church and they were hungry and Paul was on the move westward. So he had to get a lot of things done. He looked, I'm only going to be here a couple weeks or maybe less than that. So we got to get after this. I got a lot to teach you. People that go to the mission field know what I'm saying. They, they, they know the urgency of the hour and they, they leave materials. They leave as much information as they can leave that's important to their going there. Well, on his way, on one of the typical days as he was headed to Lydia's house for Bible study and prayer and fellowship, a demon-possessed slave girl would shout after him, this man has come to us and he's representing God and he's preaching a gospel of grace and yeah, 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 yeah. And she would, and listen, what she was saying was true. All right? She wouldn't say anything that wasn't true. She was that demon for this person, person now. She's screaming out that side. Now listen, the man who owned her, she was a slave girl, the man who owned her was running a uh, a, a, like a circus. You remember in the old day when you went to the circus, there was always the weirdo show they had, you know, with the, you remember those fairs? Man, well, maybe they did away with them out of my time. But they had, a, every, every circus had a weirdo place, you know, a guy with four ears or something. <laughs> Well, this is what this guy was doing. He was running a circus with a weirdo show. They had this demon possessed girl that was doing all kinds of stuff. And he was making money off of her. He was running this, this he was making money off of her. You, you ought to read this. This is do you not read this stuff in the Bible? This is good stuff. This is funny. It, 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 it's not happening to me and you, so it's funny. Okay? So Paul, Paul is, she does it every day he's on the way and it gathers a crowd, makes money. The guy's making money off from this. Every day Paul goes through there. She does her little deal and uh, people are paying money to hear it, right? The guy's making money. If you read it, you're going to see all that. I'm just giving you a, a clip, clip note version, right? Clip note. Well, you don't know those either, but anyhow, clip note version. So, one day, Paul just gets tired of this. This whole deal, every day going to there, there's no other way to get there. They go, and so he calls it, he, he casts out the demon. And the guy goes, he just, he just destroyed my business. Hey, what are you doing? So he takes him to court. He takes Paul to court. And they, th Paul, they put Paul in prison. They put Paul in prison. Now he's got to make a defense and a confirmation. Right? He's in prison. You know what Paul did when he was in prison? Same he did when he, was not, when he wasn't in prison. Preached the gospel, sang hymns, prayed to God. And the, 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 listen... The prisoners got saved. Even the warden got saved. He got so saved that when Paul got out of prison, and listen, you know how Paul got out of prison? This is good stuff. You should read this. This, this is better than TV. God caused an earthquake. An earthquake that hit the jail. An earthquake like it jumped over stuff and hit a, it, it hit the jail. Listen, it hit the jail in a specific way. It opened all the doors and it broke all the chains on prisoners.
Is that not something? You ought to read this stuff. And the ward, warden was so put out by it that he was going to kill himself rather than have them do it. The authorities do it. And Paul went, no, 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 don't do that. And he said, I've got to do it because of Paul, listen, all the prisoners stayed. Not a prisoner escaped. Not one. They had every opportunity. Not one escaped. And the warden went like, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. And Paul said, well, believe this. And he gave the gospel and he got saved. He, the warden took Paul to his house and Paul got the whole household saved. Isn't that a wonderful story? That was my, my Cliff Note version of Acts 16. It's a wonderful story of what God can do when he sends you someplace. Listen, we, God sent him there. And listen, God's going to take care of you. He puts you on a mission field. He's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of your ministry. You belong to God. You don't belong to the government. You don't belong to the warden. You belong to God. And he proved it. The confirmation of his imprisonment and his defense of the gospel was when God turned him loose. Not one prisoner left the jail. The warden couldn't believe it. I mean, who could not believe that? It's a wonderful story. And listen, it's all found in verse 7 out of the book of Acts 16. When Paul wrote, It is only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. See, that was confirmation of the gospel to the church, to the church, the new church and the new converts that God, God Almighty had sent Paul to them, this great teacher of grace. And he went on to reach the rest of Macedonia and went into Archaea. It is a wonderful. And Paul's heart was filled with this that they participated with him. That Listen, the house, listen to me. Listen, you're missing the point of this thing. Eh? You know that how when Paul was in, the, in prison and doing his thing in prison, you know, he never stopped preaching, did he? Never stopped praying, never stopped singing hymns. He's just in a different place. He didn't sit around, suck his thumb, and whine and cry. Oh, God sent me, look what you did to me. He didn't do any of that. Neither should you. Neither should you. Neither should I. Listen, we have so much to be thankful for to sit around and whine. So, this little church, they, 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 listen, they participated in his imprisonment. What they do? They kept meeting. They kept meeting. They kept praying. They didn't stop. What are we going to do? The pastor can't come. Well, we're still going to assemble. We're going to assemble and we're going to fellowship and we're going to pray and somebody's going to teach something. <clears throat> my, my, my. Where, what has happened to us people? Listen, in the fourth, fourth chapter of Philippians, in the fourth chapter of Philippians, verse 15 and 16, I put on your paper. Nevertheless, Paul writes, you have done well to share with me. You see that word share? It's the same word, partner, partaker. It's the same word, partaker. They are jointly involved in Paul's great ministry. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me. See, I put it down there. See there? It has the preposition on the front of it. Same word. In my afflictions, and you yourself also know Philippians. Listen, Paul has now left them and has gone on. 
And he's getting the same, going through the same struggles. And they're still participating with Paul. Philippian, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I departed from Macedonia, no church, no church uh, shared with me, there's that word again, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. See, grace. Paul just taught us two wonderful things about grace. You got to have a grace attitude on both sides, a giving and a receiving. That's the two sides of grace. Okay. We all like receiving. Sometimes we, we, we grumble about giving. We shouldn't grumble about either one. If you're going to grumble about what, what you receive, don't receive it. If you're going to grumble about what you're giving, don't give it. In the morning, it'll just turn to rot anyhow. You, you got to appreciate the manna. And uh, so, so for us here at Grace Valley, I wrote on your paper during the month of November of 23, say November. November. Thank you. The November of this year, Grace Valley Bible Church will become great partners, great grace partakers and partners with three missionaries with boots on the field. By that I mean they have moved their residency to that specific place. They, are, they have set up home with their family. Uh, that's what I call boots on the field. The Morgans in, listen, we're going to take up collections in November, so start thinking of this. We're going to do this for the Morgans in the Philippines. The, these are from our church. The Molinars from South Africa and the Myers from the Ukraine. These are the three that we are in supporting right now. Plus, we have Jackie headed to Indonesia in, uh, right, in August, in August, uh, along with uh, a team. Uh, Rick is, listen, you should stay up with what's happening under his ministry in Africa. It, 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 is, it, it is a biblical proportions. You should be praying for that. When he sends these notes out to you, you should read them and you should pray for this, these team members out there. They're doing phenomenal work on the grace of God. They're reaching pastors like crazy. And, uh, and you should be very, when they tell you they're going out and they're going out to the field, you should be much in prayer. You should be much in prayer for Jackie and their team as they go to Indonesia because they're going to go out there and do what Paul did. They're going to do what Paul did. When Rick goes to Africa and these places, but Rick is doing what Paul did. He's preaching a solid gospel and a, and a clear policy of grace in, in the Christian life. We are, we are blessed people. Uh, write this down, Matthew 19, 21. Write it down there near that, that November offering that we're going to take for these people. You know what it says? Hey, listen to what it says. You'll know this. You just don't know where it was. Th did I tell you Matthew 19? Uh -huh. Matthew 19, 21. This is a, lay up for yourself treasures where? So that's what grace teaches you. This is, the Philippians, this is what the Philippians, this is what they learned about the giving and receiving part of grace. That when you, when you invest, you invest in the things of heaven, not the things of earth. The things of earth, are all, they're, they're going to rust, mold, and depart. It, listen, in one, in one sweep of, of somebody's bad decision, they can wipe out. And they, they, listen, they almost got your four, your, uh, four, um, 401 or whatever that. Yeah, your 401k. Look how quick they, they whacked it. It's just a stroke of a pen, just a bad decision. Uh, that ain't never going to happen in heaven. In heaven, it multiplies to your benefit. If you think your money is safe on earth, it ain't safe on earth. But where it is safe is in heaven. 
Listen, it says lay up for who? For yourself. Lay up, that's what we all lay up treasures for is ourselves, right? We lay it up for ourselves, and then maybe for our, the future of our children or something like that, their college education, and then we're thinking about leaving them some kind of an estate help to get them down the road. But we all do that. We're always laying up for yourself, but the difference is, is where you lay them. Huh? I can only teach it. <laughs> I can only teach it and live it myself. So, anyhow, let, let me look at a few points before I have to get out of here because I've talked a whole lot. First of all, when you study the first chapter of Philippians, you know what, what, what he's excited about. It's the gospel. The gospel dominates chapter 1. In fact, it dominates the book because it dominated chapter 1. Chapter 1 is going to dominate the book, right? Well, every, every first, first few chapters... Look, when I went to school, we always read the first chapter and the last chapter if we didn't read anything. <laughs> if we didn't read anything in between. Right? How's it start and how's it finish? That's the book of Philippians. It's, it's worth a whole read. It's only four little chapters. It's not a big deal. It's a big book, though. It dominates. It dominates chapter. I gave you an outline, a homiletical outline that you could actually teach from. It could be four lessons. In the first chapter, verses 3 through 11, is partakers of the grace gospel. 12 through 15, the progress of the grace gospel. Is 16 through 26, the proclaiming of the grace gospel, and 27 through 30, don't miss that one, being persecuted for the grace gospel. You know, you can talk to somebody personally in your business place about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They go, I don't want to hear it, but, but thank you. They'll walk away. But if they're in a leadership position, they'll persecute you for it. Now talk to some talk to some teachers that are actively engaged in the educational system in America today. Don't just teach them. Listen, don't just listen to the ones in the South who are all, who got a lot to say about it. Talk to them in some of the northern states, in the eastern and western states. You wouldn't send your kids to them. They'd be dumber than a brick. And what's Paul's point? I'll tell you what Paul's point is. It always is about grace. For by grace you've been saved through faith. That's a common, that's a common salvation. Not of yourself it is a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Here's the second point. The Philippian church partnered with the evangelism of Paul's missionary team because of his grace policy of no charge. That's what caught their attention on the front side. Now, as they learned grace, they began to appreciate the whole concept of grace. But what caught their attention? Look, every day going to church, everybody got hit with this demon-possessed girl and this guy making money off from her, right? Right? Come see the weirdo tell you weirdo things and give me some weirdo money. But, but watch. What impressed them when Paul came in and preached the gospel of salvation without any charge. They were not, the world's not used to that, right? Right? They'll, they'll suck the blood out of you to get your, their money. Right. So, no charge. You should read 1 Corinthians. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians to the Corinthian church in uh, Archaic. He talks about it. In 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 9, 14 through 18, Paul, I, I picked out verse four, four, 18. I picked out verse 18. Paul said, this idea that people are impressed with, I don't charge. They want to know, well, what's your reward? I mean, what do you get out of this? Listen to what he said. 
When I preach the gospel, I offer the gospel without charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about verses 8 through 14 where people who have ministry have a right to make a living from it. But he didn't because he was after people of the world to bring them out of the world into a grace principle. His whole idea was to get people saved by grace and teach them grace. He said, I could have, I could have done that, but I didn't because it interfered with the teaching of grace. It's all about God. And so it's important that you, you under, understand this kind of stuff. Where did Paul pick that up? Where did Paul and the apostles pick that up? Picked it up from Jesus in Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 8. Jesus said in Matthew, verse 8, True, freely you receive, freely you give. Freely. <laughs> freely. The world understands freely. <laughs> they don't understand grace, but they do understand free. We send kids to camp who parents won't send them or can't send them, we send them freely. But somebody paid as those who understand grace. Freely, <laughs> grace is freely. God sent his only begotten son to die on our cross for our sins, to take our judgment, to take God's wrath for our sins. Freely, huh. Freely. Mm. Paul is writing, when Paul writes to the Corinthian church of Archaea, he said, or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God without charge? You know who was funding his ministry? The little church at Philippi. When I say a little church, our church may be big. Do you know that the mega churches like those in Jerusalem weren't funding them? Legalism, not grace. Second Corinthians 11, chapter verse 7, I just quoted. You should read as I put on your paper. If I write it on your paper, what should you do? should read it. I don't put it down there for no reason, people. In 2 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 9, he, he, he says, And when I was present with you, I was in need. Talking to the Corinthians now. He has left Macedonia of Greece and has gone down to Archaea of Greece. I was not a burden to anyone, for when the brethren came from Macedonia... What's it? They fully supplied my need. That little church. If you think you think about a big church, this one not a big. This is a church like ours. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you, and I will continue to do so. It is at Corinth. Acts 18.3, that Paul reveals that he worked as a tent maker to keep his ministry running. When the little church ran out of Philippi ran out and couldn't give him enough money, he went to work and supplied it. Could he have charged? Yeah, but he didn't because he didn't want to confuse the doctrine of grace. And we understand how important that is, Horton. We understand how important that is when, because people always ask you, well, what do you charge? And then you have an opportunity to talk about grace to a person that may not understand it. Point number three. See, this, while this was true in uh, Archaea with Corinthians, it wasn't true in Macedonia because Philippi up in Macedonia, set a standard for that whole region. That church and, and the church at, at uh, Thessalonica, they were very grace-oriented. But when they got down there in the bigger cities, 
They, they, they were not buying into that, and Paul had to really work hard. Lydia was the first Macedonian European convert uh, to the call to Europe. Lydia opened her home and became the first European church. Acts 16. Paul had evangelized the Macedonian of Philippi and Thessalonica uh, in uh, Macedonia and then moved on to Archaea where he, uh, I, I, that's not, I haven't written that very well, where he, he did uh, Corinth, he evangelized Corinth, and then he wrote back three great books. Uh, well, he actually wrote a book, the book of Philippians, two books to the Thessalonians and two books to Corinth. And listen, those books are well worth your read because Paul's vision is Europe. You understand that? It's called the Macedonian call of Acts 16. It was to go westward. I know you know that. Listen, anytime Paul went eastward, he got in trouble. <laughs> Anytime he went east, he got in trouble with the Lord. What, where are you going? Well, I'm, I'm taking a trip east. Uh, uh, uh. I told you to go what direction? Uh, I told you to go west. You know, there's a north and a south and an east. And a, I told you to go west. I mean, how is it possible that you're going the opposite direction? Oh. Oh. I've had trouble with people like that before. You know, you know, the Holy Spirit would go like, read Jonah. That's how the Holy Spirit works. Read Jonah. <laughs> Paul was having great evangelism by preaching the gospel of salvation in the Macedonian call westward towards Spain, Romans 15, 28. It was a directional call like the one given to Jonah to Nineveh. Anytime Paul, from this point on, anytime Paul goes any direction other than west, he gets in trouble with the Lord. And that should be, listen, if you feel like you have a calling on your life, you need to pay attention to that stuff. You need to pay attention. Let me close this out. The church of Philippi was Paul's first missionary trip, a church lampstand in Europe. This is really important. It came out of the Macedonian call of Acts 16, 9 through 10. Jesus established the lampstand idea. John, in Revelation, picked it up and, and taught it. In Revelation 1.20, John referred to the seven churches of Asia Minor as the seven lampstands. That is a that Listen, he believed that those seven churches were the light to the world of missionary work. I'll tell you why in a minute. In Revelation, the second chapter, verse 5, John warned them of having their lampstand removed. And he talks to every one of the seven churches about it. He writes... Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent. Do the deeds you did from the first, or else I am coming to you, and I will remove your lampstand out of its place. That's a message to the Ephesian church, the church at Ephesus. Jesus introduced this concept. In John the 8th chapter, verse 12, when he said that he was the light, of the world. Then Jesus spoke to them and he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the, watch this, the light of life. In the Sermon on the Mount, that, you know, that Acts 5 through 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus declared to his followers, more about this light. You, you, he said, are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand so that it would give light to all those who are in the house. Back in my day, we called them lanterns. 
Okay. Well, we need to understand that we are partakers of the grace of God. And we, it doesn't matter how big we are. It's how grace-oriented are we to support great missionary work, not only in our community, in our outreach of Moody and St. Clair County or the state of Alabama or, or, or America. But listen, we need to, listen, we're commissioned to reach to the uttermost parts of the earth. We can do that. There's no doubt we can do that. We're sending people out. We've got people already out on the field. We send people all the time to the uttermost parts of the earth. It's not your size. It's your grace orientation. It's understanding that we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven and not just on earth. And so... Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us as we enter the book of Philippians. What a, what a dynamic idea, a whole, new, a whole new field of missionary work has opened for Paul. It's, it's good, it, 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 it is headed towards Europe. What a phenomenal idea, and it's got Paul excited and great and powerful things are moving. It's a wonderful thing. We want the, to be like the Philippian church who want to participate in that movement of God. We want to participate in it. Not just a movement in our community. We want to participate with that. But we want to participate in the movement on a worldwide scale. We want a vision greater than ourselves like Paul had with the Macedonian call. God called him to convert Europe. My, my, my. My, my, my. And Jesus said, go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Go, stretch yourself as far out into that world as you can stretch yourself with people that understand grace. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We take an offering today to keep our lamp stand in place, that we can teach the truth of the word of God, that we can prepare people for ministry, that we can send them to the highway and the hedges and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That is our prayer, Father, and our desire, our heartfelt desire in Jesus' name. Amen.